Uh, so we're continuing our commentary to the work of Imam Bukhari rahmatullah alayhi, uh, entitled Al-Adab al-Mufrad, which is a, a standalone work dealing with the etiquettes that a Muslim should live his life in accordance to. And we've reached hadith, uh, chapter number 15. And chapter number 15 of this blessed book is entitled Bab Uquq al-Walidayn, Bab Uqubati Uquq al-Walidayn. The punishment for disobeying parents. The punishment for being disobedient to parents. And as we previously explained, the word aquq, which is used in this chapter heading and in the hadith, it refers to the opposite of, uh, it comes from the meaning of qat or severing. And so when we talk about aquq al walidain, we're talking about severing the ties of kinship that we have between ourselves and our parents, no matter how it's done. It could be done via rude, uh, bad treatment. It could be done by speaking harshly and rudely to them. It could be done by disobeying them. It could be done by ignoring them. It could be done by actually having no relationship with them whatsoever. However it's done, it basically comes under the category of uquq, or disobedience, or being uh, the opposite of uh, showing good treatment to our parents. So basically it's the opposite of showing good treatment to our parents. Um, if the sisters can't hear upstairs, they can come downstairs and sit in the meeting room on the side, inshallah. They can come from the main hall. So the chapter is dealing with the punishment for not being good to your parents or to our parents. The punishment for not dealing with our parents in the best possible way. Because as we know, what Islam requires of us is not just to deal with our parents well but to deal with our parents in the best possible way. That's the obligation we have towards our mothers and towards our fathers. To deal with them in the best possible way. To speak to them in the best possible way. To obey them in the best possible way. To have no hatred or reluctance in our hearts and no dissatisfaction in our hearts towards our parents. All of this is what's required of us as children towards our parents. So, uquq al our Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, and it's the first hadith quoted in this chapter by Imam Bukhari Rahmatullah Alayhi, from Abi Bakra. It's not Abu Bakr, Abu Bakra. مَا مِنْ ذَنْبٍ أَجْدَرُ أَنْ يُعَجَّلَ لِصَاحِبِهِ الْعُقُوبَ مَا مَا يُدَّخَرُ لَهُ مِنَ الْبَغْيِ وَقَتِيَةِ الرَّحِمِ That our Messenger Alayhi Salatu Wasallam said, there is no wrong action, no sin, that is more likely to bring punishment in this world, in addition to what is stored up for it in the next world, than oppression and severing the ties of kinship. There's no wrong action, there's no sin that's more likely to bring about punishment in this world, in addition to what's stored up for it in the next world, than oppression and severing the ties of kinship. And severing the ties of kinship. Both these sins have consequences in this world and they have consequences in the next world as well. The oppressor, the one who, who is tyrannical, the one who is unjust to other people around him, he will have the consequences of that sin, the punishment of that sin in this world. And he will have the punishment of that sin in the hereafter as well. When he meets those people, he oppressed. When he meets those people, he was uh, tyrannical towards. And he will meet these people when he needs his deeds the most. As the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam taught us that the, the tyrant, the oppressor, he will meet the people he oppressed on the Sirat, on the bridge. And this bridge, we know, spans the back of hellfire. And anybody, all of mankind, all the believers must cross this bridge. All Muslims must cross this bridge. In fact, all of mankind must cross this bridge. And the only thing that will allow people to cross this bridge successfully is Iman and good deeds. And if people don't have these two things, or they are weak in these two things, then they will fall, it, they will fall off the bridge and into hellfire, wali azabillah. The tyrant, the oppressor, he will meet those he oppressed on this bridge. When he needs his deeds the most, and he is desperate for his deeds. And they will have mutual recompense on the bridge, where the, uh, the good deeds of the tyrant we be piled onto the deeds of the oppressed. And if they're not enough, then the sins of the oppressed will be piled on 
to the, to the deeds of the oppressor until justice has been done between the two. And so when this oppressor needs his deeds the most, he'll find that he's losing them. Whatever few deeds he may have, whatever deeds he may have, when he needs them the most, when he's absolutely desperate for them, he's losing them. He's crying out for his deeds and they're leaving him one by one when he meets the people he oppressed. Until well, the other pillar, that person will fall into her fire. So the person who is oppressed, or who is the oppressor rather, he will have that punishment in this world. He will have a punishment for that sin in the hereafter as well. And likewise for disobeying parents. Likewise for being rude and disobedient to our parents. The person will be punished in this world as well as the hereafter. And we know that from amongst the signs that Allah wants good for his servant, as a general rule, as a general rule, from amongst the signs that Allah wants good from his servants, is that he punishes them for sins in this world, so that he doesn't have to punish them for them in the hereafter. Our Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that if Allah wants good for his slave, he hastens on the punishment for his sins in this world. And if he wants bad for his slave, he withholds from him the punishment the punishment for his sin in this world and instead gives it to him in the hereafter. So this is a general rule that for sins, Allah, if he punishes us in this world for those sins, we are saved from being punished in the hereafter for those sins with the exception of these two. With the exception of these two. Oppression and being rude to our parents. These two sins, while the billah, a person will be punished for them in this life and the next. May Allah save us from them. And not only is the oppressor someone who is tyrannical to other people, an oppressor is someone who's also somebody who's tyrannical to his own parents, someone who's rude and unjust to his own parents. So a person who's unjust and rude to his parents is actually guilty of both these sins. He's guilty of being, he's guilty of aquq, he's guilty of treating his parents badly, and he's also guilty of oppressing his parents. So the actual person who is uh, disobeying his parents is actually guilty of both these sins. So he could actually be in a situation worse than the one who is just a tyrant by himself. The next hadith that the Imam quotes, Rahmatullah Ali, is a hadith of Imran ibn Hussein, where the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is asked the question, ما تقولون في الزنا وشرب الخمر والسرقة قلنا الله rather the messenger of Allah asks this question what do you think of zina fornication and drinking alcohol and stealing قلنا الله ورسوله أعلم we replied the companions replied Allah and his messenger know best he said هن الفواحش وفيهن العقوبة they are acts of they are outrageous actions they are filthy actions and there is a punishment for them as well for these three sins zina and shub al-khamr and sariqa fornication and alcohol and stealing but shall not tell you of the greatest of the major sins i.e. sins that are greater than even these i.e. fornication and drinking alcohol and stealing ashirku billah azza wa jal committing shirk with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and being disobedient to your parents. Being disobedient to your parents. Greater than even zina. Greater than even drinking alcohol and stealing. And وَكَانَ مُتَّكِئَ فَاحْتَفَزَا قَالَ وَالزُّورِ And he had been reclining when he said this. And then he sat up straight. And he said lying as well. And lying. So, committing shirk with Allah. Disobedience to parents and lying. And we've already seen another version of this hadith previously. Uh, when we talked about this uh, hadith number 15. So this hadith shows us that major sins are of different levels as we talked about before. Some are more serious than others. And amongst the most serious, more serious than even fornication and drinking alcohol and stealing is shirk with Allah and disobedience to parents and, and lying. And as, I, as Aisha radiallahu anha used to say, there is no trait more abhorrent to our messenger sallallahu alayhi wa than lying itself. 
Yeah. Is Azur lying in general, or is it false testimony? So the the hadith mentions two. There's two versions of the hadith. One mentions waqawl azur, and one mentions washahadat azur. One mentions false speech, and one mentions mentions false testimony, and both are meant here: false speech and false testimony. So. In these 30 hadith we've uh, covered so far in this chapter, we've seen a number of dire consequences for being disobedient to our parents. We've seen a number of dire consequences. And actually it's really amazing the number of punishments that are linked to this one sin. Sometimes, you know, in Islam you get a sin, you get a punishment, one punishment linked to it, either in this world or the next. You might get your hands chopped off for stealing or whatever. There's one punishment linked. But for, parents, for disobedience to parents, there is a whole host of punishments linked to it. A whole host of consequences linked to this sin. And there's only a handful of sins in Islam that are like this, literally. It'd be very, it's very hard to think of other sins that have so many different consequences linked to them as a result of that single sin, of that same action. So I'm asking you, for, for those who have been attending for the last few circles, Give me what you remember, or let us tell me what you remember of the consequences of disobeying parents. What do we remember from the consequences of disobeying parents? Lack of, lack of blessing in your rent. Okay. Lack of blessings generally, yes. Okay. Disobeying them is directly to disobeying Allah. Disobeying them is disobedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Punishment in this life and in the next. We just learned about the fact that this person, one of the unique aspects of this sin is that Allah will punish you both in this life and the next and not just in this life and then use it as an excuse not to punish you in the next both, you'll be punished in both worlds anything else you can remember? Lack of Barakah we've talked about Lack of Barakah already sorry? you will not get into paradise, yeah so let's go through them in order actually so First, yes, Allah's displeasure. The first few hadith we learned that the person who is displeased, when the parents are displeased with a child, Allah is displeased with that child. And when the parents are happy with that child, Allah is happy with that child. We learned that Allah's curse, Allah's curse is upon the person who disobeys his parents. We've learned that it's a major sin, it's from the kabair, and not just a major sin, one of the major, major sins, the worst of the major sins. We've learned that, as you said, disobedience to parents is disobedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We've learned that a person who is disobedient to his parents, Allah will punish him by making him a person who is a tyrant and wretched and insolent in this life. We've learned that what is one of the greatest forms of ingratitude to Allah and to the parents to be ungrateful and disobedient to the parents. We've learned that a person who disobeys his parents will not even enter paradise. We've learned that Allah will not even look at a person on the last day who disobeys his parents. We've learned from the dua of Jibreel and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa saying ameen to that dua that a person who does not serve his parents and is disobedient to them, may he be disgraced and humiliated. So how many is that? That's uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. That's ten different consequences, ten different sins. Sorry, the ten different punishments from Allah for the single act, for the single act. And I really, really should stress to us the severity this deed has in the sight of Allah's Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The severity this deed has in the sight of Allah. Allah's displeasure is upon that person. Allah's curse is upon that person. It's one of the greatest and major sins is to be disobedient to Allah. Such a person would become a tyrant and wretched and insolent. It's, the highest form of, it's one of the highest forms of ingratitude. A person who disobeys his parents will not enter paradise. Allah will not even look at such a person. And both the du'a of Jibreel and the, I mean, and the answering of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that made such a person become disgraced and humiliated. May Allah save us from this. The next chapter Imam Bukhari rahmatullahi brings is Bab Buka al Walidain. Making the parents weep, making the child, making the parents cry. <clears throat> Again, we talked about this previously in the previous chapters. 
Ibn Umar radiallahu anhu by the Imam Bukhari quotes, he says, Yaqul, Buka'ul walidayni min al wal kabair. The child making his parents cry is a form of disobedience and one of the major sins. The child making the parents cry is a form of disobedience and one of the major sins. And in another hadith, we've talked about hadith number eight previously, where Ibn Umar is listing the major sins. One of the ones he mentions was Buka'ul Walidayni min al uquq the parents crying because of the disobedience of their child. We've already covered these hadith in detail, we're not going to cover them again. And the next chapter, which is the main chapter for today, inshallah, Bab Da'watil Walidain, the supplication of the parents, the dua the parents make either for their child or against their child. What's the significance of this? Sorry, Bob. Yeah. So previously there was a narration in which um, someone who was going on jihad or hijrah yeah. and, and he'd left his parents weeping behind him. Yeah. So go and make me laugh yeah. as you make me weep. Um, so similarly, is there a weep there's a weeping because of disobedience and there's a weeping because of worry and recklessness. Yeah, so what we're talking about here, where we should the one that's a major sin is the one that's because of disobedience. Which is why Ibn Umar says, Buka al min al wal kabair. The parents crying because of their child's disobedience is one of the, is, sorry, the parents crying is an example of uquq is an example of disobedience and one of the major wrong actions or major sins. So what he's saying is that the crying that results because of disobedience is the one that we're talking about here, not because of the worry and concern that a parent might have for the child. Yeah, those are two different things. It's a, good, it's a good clarification. So the supplication, the supplication that the parent makes, both parents, mother or father, for or against their child. For or against their child. So Abu Huraira radiallahu anh said, قَالَ النَّبِيُّ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمُ ثَلَاثُ دَعْوَاتٍ مُسْتَجَابَاتٌ لَهُمْ لَا شَكَّ فِيهِمْ دَعْوَةُ الْمَظْلُومِ وَدَعْوَةُ الْمُسَافِرِ وَدَعْوَةُ الْوَالِدِي عَلَى وَلَدِهِ That there are three supplications that will be answered and there's absolutely no doubt in this. There are three supplications that will be answered لا شك فيهن There's no doubt in this whatsoever. The supplication of the one who is oppressed because the supplication of the one who is oppressed is dua is heartfelt, it's coming from the heart. وَدَعْوَةُ الْمُسَافِرِ and the supplication of the one who is traveling, because often the one who is traveling is undergoing difficulty and hardship in his, in his journey. <coughs> and the supplication of the parent against his child, and the scholars mentioned included in this is actually the, included for the child as well, both against and for the child. Why? Because that, such a supplication again comes from the heart. It comes from the heart of the parent, a supplication for or against the child. And so these are three supplications that our Messenger وسلم, said they are answered and there's no doubt at all in the fact that they will be answered. The one who is oppressed, the one who is oppressed, the one who is going, undergoing, undergoing hardship and difficulty and he's going through oppression and, tyr uh, and facing tyranny, that person's dua will be, will be answered. And this is so much the case that even if a kafir makes a dua to Allah in this situation, Allah will answer that dua. Even if a kafir, a non-Muslim, when he is going, when he is oppressed, when he is going through intense difficulty, in that situation, if he makes that sincere du'a to Allah alone, at that point Allah will, still, will answer that supplication for that the kafir as well. And this is why in the Quran it's mentioned a number of times that Allah has taught, gives examples of Allah answering du'as of kuffar, of disbelievers, when they are in extreme hardship, when they are in a state of desperation. وَإِذَا مَسَّكُمُ الدُّرُ فِي الْبَحْرِ ضَلَّ مَنْ تَدْعُونَ إِلَّا إِيَّا And when harm touches you at sea, when you're about, the waves are coming and crashing down upon you, you think you're about to die, those you call upon besides him vanish. They disappear. And you only end up calling upon him alone. فَلَمَّا نَجَاكُمْ إِلَى الْبَرِّ أَعْرَضْتُمْ And then when he saves you and leads and lead you to the land, you turn away. Meaning by, by this he answered the supplication. They cried out to him in desperation 
They forgot all their gods and they cried out to Allah alone and they're disbelievers. Allah answered their supplication. When He saved them and took them to a land, you turned away. وَكَانَ الْإِنسَانُ kafura, And man is ever ungrateful. And our Messenger وسلم, said, Beware of the dua of the oppressed. Beware of the supplication of the oppressed. Because there's no veil between it and Allah. There's nothing separating it and Allah. It goes directly to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And in a narration, in another narration, Beware of the dua of the oppressed. Because there's no veil between it and Allah. Even if he is an evil person. Even if that person is making that du'a is an evil person because his evil is against himself. So in this situation where the person is being oppressed, even if he's an evil person, in that, in that circumstance, if he calls it out to Allah sincerely, Allah will answer that supplication. And this shows us another important point that when often when Muslims when we think about oppressing others. What's in the forefront of our minds of oppressing? We think about oppressing Muslims. Oh, we're not allowed to oppress Muslims, we're not allowed, which is fine, it's true. But actually we're not allowed to oppress Muslims and non-Muslims. Here the kafir is making a dua to Allah and Allah is answering because he's oppressed. It doesn't matter who's oppressing him. Allah will answer the supplication of the, of the non-Muslim, even the evil person. We're not allowed to oppress the righteous. We're not allowed to oppress the evil. We're not allowed to oppress the Muslim. We're not allowed to oppress the non-Muslim. We're not even allowed to oppress animals. We're not even allowed to oppress Allah's creation. None of this is allowed for the Muslim. The second du'a that's going to be likely to be answered is because it's a du'a of the, of the traveler. Because of uh, the difficulty normally that a traveler will endure during that, during that journey. And the third du'a that's likely to be answered is a du'a of the parent for or against the child. And in this hadith, Allah mentions Al-Walid, the father. He doesn't actually mention the mother in this, in this hadith. But the scholars mention that actually the mother is more so the case because her rights are greater than the rights of the father. So if the father's du'a is answered, then what's, what of the one whose rights are greater when she makes a du'a against or for the child? And our messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, كُلُّ شَيْءٍ بَيْنَهُ وَبَيْنَ اللَّهِ عَزَّ وَجْهِ حِجَابٍ إِلَّا شَهَادَةَ أَنْ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ وَدُعَاءَ الْوَالِدِ لِي وَلَدِهِ That everything has a veil between it and Allah that must be first traversed or must be crossed except for the shahada لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ and except for the dua of the parent for his or her child except for the and the dua of the parent for his child or her child so everything has a veil between it and Allah that has to be traversed, that has to be crossed. The criteria have to be met, except for the shahada la ilaha illallah. And except for the dua that the parent makes for the child. And one time Al Hassan al Basri, he was asked, uh, sorry, Al Hassan was asked, the grandson of the Messenger, he was asked, what do you say of the dua that the parent makes for his child? What do you say for the dua that the parent makes for his child? Qala Najat. He said, this is victory. This is success. And for, what do you say for the dua that's against the child? And he said, this is isti'sal, it's um, imprisonment. It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a curse effect. So the first time he says Najat, he raises his hands like this. And the second time the curse, he's putting his hands down. It's a curse for him, it's an imprisonment for him. And so the dua of the parent for or against the child is answered by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When it's done in a time of sincerity, when it's time done and coming from the heart, when it's done in a, done in a time of, of um, pure like of need, if you like. And for this, for us, it's a, a dire warning for a child not to upset our parents. Because if we upset our parents to the extent where they make a dua against us for, to, uh, to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that is imprisonment for us. It's a curse for us. This is something that Allah could answer. And if Allah answers it, and is most, more likely to be answered by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then what? 
We have the du'a of our parents against us. And the scholars also mention here, as a point of advice to us as parents, to us as parents, not us as children, but to us as parents, be very careful when making a supplication against your child. Be very careful as parents when, making a, when you get angry, not to fall into this making a supplication against your child. Because think, what would you do? How heartbroken would you be if Allah answered that supplication? And this is why the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said لا تدعوا على أنفسكم Don't supplicate, don't make du'as against yourselves ولا تدعوا على أولادكم And don't make du'a against your children ولا تدعوا على أموالكم And don't make du'a against your own wealth لا توافقوا من الله ساعة يسألوا فيها أطاء فيستجيبوا لكم It could be that you're answering, asking Allah at a time when a supplication is answered and Allah answers your supplication so here our Messenger of Allah sallallahu the mess, our Messenger alayhi salatu wasalam, is warning us. He's saying very, be very very careful when you're making these sort of supplications. This is not the norm for a Muslim. We don't make supplications against other people as a norm. We don't curse other people. We are not people who are curses. We don't curse other people as a norm. We don't make supplications to the detriment of other people as a norm. Don't make supplications against yourselves or against your children, or against your property. It could be that you're answered. In another narration, and neither against your servants. Don't make supplications against your servants. So there are three supplications that are answered without a doubt. And they are? And they are? The supplication of the oppressed. Sorry, the supplication of the musafir. And the supplication of the parent for or against the child. And then Imam Bukhari, in the, next, in the next hadith, he gives an example. He quotes an example, a famous hadith, the hadith of Juraj, where he shows how the supplication of the mother against her child is answered. And it's a long hadith, so I'm not going to quote the Arabic, I'm just going to read out the English. And the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, No child, no baby has ever spoken in the cradle except for Isa ibn Maryam and the companion of Juraj. So the companions, they knew who uh, Isa ibn Maryam was and they knew his story. But they didn't know about Juraj. So they asked the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Tell us, who is Juraj? And so the Messenger of Allah Alaihi Salatu Wasallam said, Juraj was a monk who lived in a hermitage. And uh, one day, while he was praying, while he was praying, his mother called out to him, Ya Juraj. His mother called out to him, uh, wanting something from him, Juraj. And in his prayer, he's asking himself, my mother or my prayer? He's asking this question, should I answer my mother or should I continue my prayer? And he concluded that he should pray, he's going to continue his prayer. And she shouted a third time, Ya Juraj. Again, he asked himself the question, should I answer my mother or should I continue the prayer? And then he decides for the prayer. A third time again, she shouts. Again, he has a discussion with himself. He asks himself the question, continues with the prayer. Now, just look at what this man's doing. He's not doing anything evil. He's not spending time on the Xbox or watching TV or surfing the net or on his phone. He's praying. He's praying to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He's doing his salah. And then the mother gets annoyed. My son's not replying to me, not answering me. Perhaps she doesn't know the fact that he's actually in prayer. And so she says again, the dua she makes, she makes a dua against her son. But the dua she makes, again, this is proving a point that we talked about earlier. It's not a severe dua. It's not a, hot, it's not a, it's not a dua that's going to destroy the child. So again, it shows us that the dua that the parent makes, you have to be very careful about the dua that the parent makes against the child. She said, Juraj, may Allah not let you die until you have looked at the face of a prostitute. May Allah not cause you to die until you have looked at the face of a prostitute. Again, just look at this. It's regarded to be a punishment for a man to look upon the face of a prostitute. And look in today's society, 
this is like the norm, become the norm in so many places. But in Islam, in Islam, for this person, it was a punishment that he lived to see the face of a prostitute. And bring, other narrations mention that there was, there was a beautiful prostitute in the village. And uh, she was challenged to try to seduce Juraj. And she was unable to do so. She went to try to seduce him, she was unable to do, do so. She lay with her shepherd instead. And as a result, she had a child. And when she had that child, the village people asked whose child it was. And she said it belongs to Juraj. This child belongs to Juraj. She's falsely accusing Juraj now. And so they asked, you mean the monk that lives in the hermitage? And she said, yes. And so the people got angry. They raised the mob and they went and they destroyed, they, they destroyed his hermitage. And they brought him before the king of that time. And when he passed, he was, so he's chained up and he's, and he's walking, being dragged back towards the king. And as he's being dragged to the, towards the king by this mob, again he passes by this prostitute. And when he sees this prostitute, he smiles. When he sees this prostitute, he smiles. And the people are confused. Why is he smiling? He's being dragged and he's seeing the prostitute and he smiles. And the king, he's brought before the king. And the king asks him this question. Do you know what this woman is claiming? And Jureja asks, what's she claiming? She claims that you are the father of her child. So he asks the king, where is this baby? Where is this baby? The baby is brought. And then he goes, Juraj goes to this baby and he asks this baby the question, who is your father? And the baby speaks. And the baby says, the cow, the shepherd is my father. And of course now everybody's repentant. And the king asks him, we want to rebuild your hermitage. What we destroyed, we want to rebuild it. And we want to rebuild it out of gold. And Juraj says, no. Okay, then out of silver. And he goes, no, just build it, build, rebuild it as it was. Put it back the way it was. And then the king asks him, these people have told me that you smiled when you passed by this woman. Why did you smile? And he replied, when I passed by this woman, I realized that it was a dua of my mother that had overtaken me. And then he told him about the dua of his mother. So then I realized it was a dua of my mother that had overtaken me. So, this is an example that Imam Bukhari quotes an authentic hadith which gives an example of how the du'a of the parent against the child is answered. And there actually, this, this is a long hadith as, I, as you quoted, it's actually a hadith that's worthy of being studied. And scholars when they've commented on this hadith, they derive more than 100 points of benefit from this single hadith. We're not going to go through them at all, it's impossible to go through in one session the 100 points of benefit. but. Um, you can find articles on this hadith on the internet, you can find books, I think there's translated books as well commenting on this hadith. It's worth studying this hadith. It's worth studying this hadith with your children as well. Because of the points of benefit this hadith has. A hundred dollar points of benefit. And the, the greatest point of benefit for, us here, benefit for us here is the obligation of answering our parents and the fact that the dua of the parents against the child is answered. It shows us that if the child is in a nuffle prayer, not an obligatory prayer, if a child is in a nuffle prayer and his mother or father calls out for a need, it is better for that child to break the prayer and go and answer the need of the, of the parent than to continue the prayer. So if we're praying nuffle prayers, not for us, not the, the, the obligatory prayers, the nuffle prayers, and our parents call out to us, it's better for us to break the prayer and go and answer, their, answer them find out what they want, meet their need, and if you want to then go back and return to, 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 uh, to, the sub, to, uh, to that muffled prayer. Um, one of the great benefits of this hadith, they said, Sahib al is not harmed by fitting. A person who is true to Allah is not harmed by trials and tribulations. A person whose faith in Allah is unwavering and certain and is unshakable, and he has his tawakkul in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Such a person, he will not be harmed by the trials and tribulations that come his way. In fact, such a person will know that the trials and tribulations that come his way are tests from Allah, and he is to be patient through those tests. And one of the points that this hadith also shows us 
and again, very relevant to today's world, where we've got so many rumours being spread against people and so many accusations made, that even the best of us can be falsely accused. Even the best of us, the best of the best can be falsely accused. And we shouldn't automatically believe accusations against people without proof. In fact, we're not allowed to do so. And on that note, we'll continue with stop for today, inshallah. If there's any questions, they can be asked. Subhanakla wa bihamdik. Ashadu an la ilaha illa ant. Astaghfiruka wa atubi ilaik. Any questions? Yeah. The prayer of a uh, traveller, um, in the earlier times it was probably very difficult. Nowadays it's uh, flights and comfortable cars. The yeah, so the ruling cell applies. And that's simply because of the fact that even in today's world, even though they're not as difficult as they used to be, they're still difficult, right? Well, I mean, if we travel from here to Saudi or to here to Pakistan, six hours, we're going to be tired at the end of our journey. We're going to have to go through some sort of hardship, you know, cramped in the chair, uh, finding it difficult to find a place to pray, make wudu, you know, you might get travel sick, all of these things. They're still, they're still there. The difficulty of travel is still there. It's just not as severe as it is. Sorry, and cost is there as well. The sacrifice, the time, it's all still there. It just may not be as difficult as it is.